Good morning, and welcome to the September Power and Partnership Breakfast of the Paducah Chamber, sponsored by Whitlow, Roberts, Houston, and Straub. We're so appreciative of you joining us for today's breakfast. We are broadcasting from the Commerce Center in the Paducah Bank Community Room, and thank you to WPSD for also live streaming this breakfast. In January of this year, of 2020, which seems like about 20 years ago, that's when we scheduled our breakfast speaker for September of this year. Uh, it had been four years, almost to the day, since Senator Paul had spoken to a Paducah Chamber event, and his staff notified us that he was going to be in Kentucky during this time and would be happy to come to Paducah and speak at our breakfast. So we were like, yes, of course, we would love to hear from our U.S. Senator. Well, a lot has happened since then, and we're still glad to be hearing from our U.S. Senator and looking forward to hearing his comments in a few minutes. He is joining us virtually from his Bowling Green office, so thank you for um, to him for his service and for joining us. While most of all of our events are taking place in a virtual format, I can assure you that the Paducah Chamber is busier than ever, working to provide great services to our members. We kicked off our annual celebration for small businesses just a few weeks ago with many events planned. We have a big um, resolution from the city and the county, uh, our proclamation about small business, and so we were very happy to be able to do that and to feature them. Thanks to Total AV Services and Joe Whitelaw for creating brief videos about three of our businesses. We did that at a drawing at the last breakfast, and so at the end of the, this breakfast after Senator Paul, we have videos about Fern Lake Campground, Jenny's Reflexology and Massage, and Bluegrass Orthodontics. So thank you to Joe for your assistance with those videos with Total AV and Joe Whitloff. Just yesterday, we partnered with the West Kentucky Workforce Board for a drive-by job fair in our back parking lot, and it was a great success. While participation didn't really guarantee placement, it sure encouraged it for a lot of people. So we had a lot of job openings and a lot of applicants. So we hope to be filling more jobs in this community for our chamber members and local businesses and for those who are seeking employment. We also kicked off our small business seminars yesterday, and these will continue for the next four Wednesdays. The sponsors are FNB Bank and Lungberg Medical Imaging. All seminars begin at 8 a.m., and you can register on the Chamber's website, paducachamber.org. They are being held via Zoom. We are recording them and also will be uh, posting them on our Facebook page and on our website. Next Wednesday, September 9th, the topic is Readjusting Operating Expenses, Cash Flow Projections, featuring Chris Waldridge, the director of the Murray State University Center for Economic and Entrepreneurial Development. This seminar will provide information about how businesses can revise their business plan and manage cash flow during economic uncertainty. On the 16th, we're going to feature the topic of marketing, trying to identify who is your marketing, your market, featuring presenters Jim Dudley and Chris Hill of Entredoing. On the 23rd, we have two local entrepreneurs discussing just how to get out of your own way to be successful with our current, current board chair, Chad Beyer of I-5 Design Group, and our former board chair, Tammy Zimmerman of Payrock. This seminar will help business owners understand how to manage time and their resources. September 30th, we'll wrap up the month with a very important topic, especially for all of those businesses who received assistance from the Paycheck Protection Program. It will be about from loan to grant the next steps, featuring a panel of local lenders and resources, including Lori Noel of FNB Bank, Ashley Grooms of Williams, Williams and Lentz, and Mark Heckenberg of Kemper CPA. So please register at paducachamber.org. We do have some new members that I want to just highlight briefly, Paducah Nutrition, Paragon Midwest Consulting, Running Boards Market Paducah, Tara Y. Savelle, and Warmoth Family Dentistry. So welcome to the Paducah Chamber, and we hope to be adding a whole lot more uh, new members, and you'll hear about that in just a second. Our D.C. trip. Next week, we should be leaving to be in D.C. for the week. We always go the second week of September, but of course, as you know, we are not able to travel this year. We are hosting what we are calling our D.C. flyback in October, and that is to continue our tradition of meeting with our members of Congress and their staff and the agencies, particularly the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation. We're looking forward to this event in October. Our presenting sponsor is Swift and Staley, and our cabinet level sponsors are Four Rivers Nuclear Partnership, GEO Consultants, and Beltline Electric. You can see our other current sponsors on the slide. We greatly appreciate our sponsors for continuing their support of this very important event for us. 
And on Monday, October 19th, we'll be outside having a great time with our annual business to business networking golf tournament with presenting sponsor Holland Stivers Employee so Employer Solutions and our gold sponsor, US Bank. It will be held at the Country Club of Paducah, so we're recruiting teams, sponsors, host sponsors, and volunteers. So let us know if you want to be involved. We just recently selected Leadership Paducah Class 34. It's our largest class ever. We were a little worried about whether or not uh, what our participation would be, but I will say that we had our uh, second record highest number of applicants, and so we chose 42 outstanding leaders to be a part of Leadership Paducah Class 34. They've had their orientation, and today will be their first full day session with us. So let me just introduce them to you very briefly. Morgan Armistead with I-5 Design Group, Wendy Baxter, Sullivan University, Dustin Bell, Swift and Staley, Nathan Bradley, Paducah Water, Lucas Brimmer, U.S. Bank, Toya Burton, Housing Authority of Paducah, Christine Cogdell, Baptist Health, Justin Crowell, Paducah Police Department, Harrison Dickens, Paducah Pepsi Mid-America, Carrie Dillard with the Paducah Chamber, Darcy Ellis, U.S. Bank, Whitney Evans, Mercy Health, Missy Fawn, Baker Firmer Workman Engineering and Testing, Brandon Hall, Veolia, Joanna Harper, Blythe CPA and Advisors, Gail Hatton, Paducah Bank, Aileen Houston Jones, Paducah Public Schools, Matt Yeager, McCracken County Library, Shondani Joshi, GEO Consultants, Rihanna Klingler, Innovations Branding House, Abby Minkus, GEO Consultants, Kimberly Malay, Beltline Electric, Lexi Milliken, Yeiser Art Center, Emily Mullins, Sylvan Learning Center, Jessica Pedersen, Four Rivers Nuclear Partnership, Heather Pierce, Greater Paducah Economic Development, Patsy Pierce, United Systems Technology Process Management, Christy Reed, Jackson Purchase Energy Corporation, Kate Sin, West Kentucky Community and Technical College, Caleb Shahadi, Federal Materials Company, Aisha Shumpert, West Kentucky Community and Technical College, Charmaine Smith, CSI, Matt Turley, CFSB, Bob Turok, FMB Bank, Sarah Vandermulen, Heartland Cares Inc., Jamie Walker, Independence Bank, Jessica Wallace, Kemper CPA Group, Cody Walls, Denton Law Firm, Brandon Waite, Marquette Transportation, Bryson Wells, Wells Mobile Detail, Tanya Worth, Bacon Farmer Workman Engineering and Testing, and Sandra Zaranti, Baptist Health Paducah. Normally, we would have introduced them in person, but today you did get to see their pictures, and we're so proud of them, and we know we have a great class selected with Leadership Paducah Class 34. So now I'm going to turn the program over to our board chair, Mr. Chad Beyer, the president and owner of I-5 Design, who's serving as our board chair this year. Chad? Thank you, Sandra, and congratulations to Class 34. I know my experience with leadership was great, and I'm wishing you the best of luck with that. I know it'll be a great experience. I want to say good morning once again in this virtual format. I bring you greetings from the Paducah Chamber Board of, Ar Board of Directors. Our directors represent a diverse and variety of large and small business throughout our community, and I appreciate their support that I have received this year from them. As a small business owner, I'm really excited about all of the activities that we have going on during our small business celebration. Small business make up the majority of our membership and we know how important it is to provide a variety of services and benefits to them as well as to all of our membership. My business, I-5 Design Group, has been a member since day one. My membership has proved to be a great value both in resources and relationships. I love small business and I have a heart for small business owners. So if you're a small business owner, I encourage you to get involved. I'm sure there are opportunities during the small business celebration and continually that will benefit your business. This month, our 2020 membership and total resource campaign kicks off. As a membership-based organization, we depend on our members to keep our chamber strong and effective. It's a team effort. By being a member of, of the chamber, our members are supporting all of these many varied support initiatives. The chamber's strength and community rests solely on its members and the, their investment in the viability of our local economy. 
as if opening our uh, local community college, college wasn't a big enough challenge for this man, we know he can easily take on one more challenge. Our incoming chair of the board will lead our 2020 membership and total resource campaign, Dr. Anton Reese, president of West Kentucky Community and Technical College, is now here to speak. Dr. Reese. Thank you, Chad, and good morning, everyone. As the chamber elect, I have the privilege of serving as the chair of our annual membership and total resource campaign. And yes, Chad, indeed, I love a good challenge. Each year, we strive to increase our overall membership and sponsorship commitments for the upcoming year. Now, you know, in ordinary years, as I understand it, there are usually 10 team captains. But as Sandra Wilson said, I'm, I'm extraordinary. So to assist us with the campaign this year, we have 11 awesome team captains. And I would like to introduce them to you now. You can do a virtual applause as I do their names. Terrence Adams with Mercy Health Lords. Lucas Bremer with U.S. Bank. Tony Copeland with Arkema. Craig Felker with Paducah Bank. Jennifer Fraser with Murray State University's Paducah Campus. Jill Hobbs with Holland Stivers Employer Solutions. Hillary Landry with McMurray and Livingston. Mike Muscarella with Baptist Health Paducah. Kevin O'Neill, West Kentucky Community Technical College. Dennis Rulo with Barkley Regional Airport. And coming back as the defending two-time champion for recruiting the most members and investment is Bradley Schulte with FNB Bank. So let the competition begin. These captains have each recruited members to work with them. And we really appreciate the time these captains, all of the volunteers, are willing to devote as well as their employers. This is an important time for the Chamber as we work on new members, renewals, and finalizing sponsorships for our events. We will be celebrating in some way at the beginning of October, and it may be one of those drive-by events uh, as mentioned. So I need to talk to someone who participated in the drive-by job fair yesterday to get some ideas of how that worked. We will celebrate our new members and honor all of our volunteers who are helping us with this effort. I will now turn it back over to you, Chad. Thank you, Dr. Reese, and we wish, wish you the best of luck with the uh, membership campaign. We know you'll do a great job, and you have a great team to support you. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our sponsor for this month's breakfast. We are appreciative of Whitlow, Roberts, Houston, and Straub for being a sponsor of our September Power and Partnership Breakfast. We appreciate the partnership the Chamber has with them. To present the remarks is Chris Hudson, Managing Partner. Chris. Thank you, Chad. Good morning. The law firm of Whitlow, Roberts, Houston, and Straub is proud to sponsor this month's Power and Partnership virtual breakfast. As you've heard, this month the Chamber is celebrating small business. Many recognize this, but it bears repeating. Small business creates jobs, increases the tax base, and contributes to a community's identity. Certainly for businesses, and particularly small businesses, the last four to six months have been challenging, presenting questions in an unprecedented time. Here's some good news. Locally, we have an award-winning Chamber of Commerce. The Paducah Area Chamber of Commerce has either provided answers or provided sources for answers in a challenging year for business. In late February of this year, I created an Outlook folder simply titled COVID-19. I did this to save emails and documents potentially useful for management of the firm during this time. The first email was from late February with our office administrator and IT administrator to confirm the plan for remote work for all Whitlow attorneys and staff. The first email I saved from the Paducah Area Chamber of Commerce was dated March 18, 2020, and if you'll indulge me, I'll tell you what the email said. It began, quote, the Paducah Chamber is committed to serving our members and the community during this time of COVID-19 pandemic. More news and resources are being announced daily and hourly, and we are continuing to monitor those through the U.S. Chamber, Kentucky Chamber, 
Small Business Administration, and other sources. The Chamber team, no doubt, will say it was just doing its job, and this is true. But the Chamber's response in time of pandemic was a response of hope. The email I just read and the others that followed and the actions that came about in the next several months did the following in my estimation. First, the Chamber set the tone for an uncertain time in our community. Second, the Paducah Area Chamber of Commerce served as a ready and steady source of information. In fact, it was my primary source of information. Third, the Chamber provided foundational hope for its members. And finally, the Chamber established common ground, a platform where all members can equally share in trustworthy and valuable information and enjoy the benefits of membership. The Whitlow Law Firm is a small business with 12 attorneys and 18 staff members all working together in four downtown buildings with uh, the old National Bank building, the historic old National Bank building, anchoring us at 3rd and Broadway. We represent clients here in Paducah and McCracken County, throughout the Commonwealth of Kentucky, in Southern Illinois, and in Middle and Western Tennessee. In 2020, Whitlow, Roberts, Houston, and Straub was honored by U.S. News with its sixth straight best law firm designation. The attorneys of the Whitlow firm are students of the law who practice with honesty and integrity and strive for clear and transparent communications. We work hard advocating for the best possible outcomes for our clients. The Whitlow firm supports small business and proudly supports our Paducah Area Chamber of Commerce. We are appreciative of the Chamber's can-do attitude and the creativity which made this month's virtual breakfast possible, and it's our pleasure to serve as sponsor of this month's virtual breakfast. Today, the Paducah Area Chamber of Commerce is pleased to have one of Kentucky's two United States Senators as this morning's guest speaker. In 2010, Rand Paul was elected to the United States Senate and is now in his second term in the Senate. Paul and his family live in Bowling Green, where he owned his own ophthalmology practice and performed eye surgery for 18 years. In 1995, Paul founded the Southern Kentucky Lions Eye Clinic, an organization that provides eye exams and surgery to needy families and individuals. He is a former president and 17-year member of Lions Clubs International, which is dedicated to preserving sight by providing eyeglasses and surgery to the less fortunate around the world. During his free time, Paul performs pro bono eye surgeries for patients across Kentucky. Additionally, he provides free eye surgery to children from around the world through his participation in the Children of the Americas program. Joining us from his office in Bowling Green is United States Senator Rand Paul. Good. Well, it's glad to be with you this morning. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction, and thank you to the Paducah Chamber for allowing me to speak. Um, for years, uh, my staff will tell you that I complain when I have to drive six hours to give a speech and six hours back, and it consumes my whole day driving, and I've always complained and said, I want to send my hologram. If I could just send my hologram, I'd be a much happier person. So here I am in virtual reality now, being able to speak without driving to Paducah or driving to Eastern Kentucky. Um, and it isn't perfect. I think it'd be better to be in person, but you know that'll happen over time. I do think though that technology has allowed us to be much more connected than we could have even five years ago. Um, I, like the rest of you, are probably doing Zoom type of conference calls on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's allowed us to have uh, still some semblance of connectivity. Um, most of you probably heard about uh, what happened to my wife and I this, this last weekend. I spoke at the Republican National Convention nominating or renominating President Trump for uh, the Republican Party. As we were about to leave that evening, we uh, headed towards the exit and our hotel was basically across the street. It wasn't even a block away, less than half a block away, we could see the entrance to our hotel. But as we got to the exit, we um, saw a mob chasing down people and the Secret Service said it's not, it's not safe to go out there. And they suggested we take a bus to a hotel further away than ours that had a, a police escort. So we did. 
We got to the hotel further away, but we still had to get back to our hotel, which was unfortunately very close to the melee and the mob scene. We thought, well, we'll get an Uber and it'll drive us right up to the door and we should be able to get from the Uber into the door of the lobby. <laughs> Not everything worked out the way we thought it would. We got about two big city blocks from the hotel and the, the streets were blocked off and we asked the policewoman if she'd let us go by and she just, you know, was told a set of orders and wouldn't, wouldn't relent. And so we had a choice of, we didn't know what to do because that's where all our stuff was and we were flying out the next day. So there wasn't anybody visible in the first block or very few people. And so, you know, I made the decision, my wife's still not too happy with me, but I said, let's try to walk the two blocks. We walked the first block and we got what I would call the normal heckling and jeering from people, the people in the street, whoever they are. People came towards us, we avoided them and walked to the other side of the street. They would yell cat calls at us. But that's something that I think, you know, most people would say is fairly minor and you can live with. But as we got close to the end of the first city block, we could see a few policemen there on the corner. We thought, if we can get to them, we'll be safe and we can make it to our hotel. So as we're walking towards the few policemen on the corner, two or three policemen, a mob turns the corner of about 30 people chanting and marching and doing whatever. But then they see me and as they get closer, they say, we've got Rand Paul. And as they surround us, they're chanting, we've got Rand Paul trapped. And, but it was not just me, it was me, my wife, and uh, two other women that had been at the convention with us. The crowd pressed in and in, and the crowd turned from 30 to 60 to 90 to probably over 100 at one point, because people came from everywhere running. Um, the people uh, hurled threats, invective, cuss words, swearing, you name it. It was, a, it was a menacing and threatening crowd as they pushed closer and closer. And really, we weren't positive that the police, two or three policemen, could hold off 100 people in a crowd uh, that were, you know, I think, bent on fury and violence. As the crowd pushed in, I leaned over to the policeman and said, you know, they know who I am, because I wasn't sure the policeman recognized me. And I said, you know, you, have, you, you need to call for reinforcements. And he did, but it seemed like an eternity. We stood there maybe for close to 15 minutes. Uh, while the crowd got more and more menacing and we became more concerned for our safety. Many of you have seen the footage from different cities, from Portland, from Minneapolis, the violence that's occurring in the streets. You've seen the people kick senseless. You've seen how a mob, when one person falls and one person kicks them, the other person decides, well, I'll kick them once or twice too. And then the next guy says, well, I'll kick them four or five times. And before you know it, they're senseless with blood running from their ears. This is what's happening in our cities. And this is what we were very, very concerned with. And if you want to know if this was their intent, the head of Black Lives Matter in Louisville was asked about this attack. And she said, oh, we live that way all the time in fear. So we're glad that he now lives in fear. And we want to make sure that he and his wife continue to live in fear. I guess I would contrast that with I've been part of protests. The Tea Party movement was a protest. I went to dozens, if not hundreds of rallies. We would give speeches. We would condemn certain legislation. Then we would set up registration tables and register people to vote. We would participate in party politics, call people to vote, mail them letters. But never once have I ever seen or heard of anybody from the Tea Party movement who was uh, surrounding and threatening and menacing elected officials. I haven't seen yet anybody from our side going into restaurants and taking Nancy Pelosi's food and dumping it on the ground as they did to Senator McConnell. This isn't what it, the First Amendment includes. The First Amendment includes and the right to assembly. All of these protections we have in our Constitution, the Bill of Rights, are about peacefully trying to bring about change. But these people have to realize that they're getting the opposite of what they intended. Because now people are so fearful of this coming to their town, we're fearful of this coming to Louisville now. The main thing they were shouting at me and my wife and menacingly shouting, you know, inches from our face was say her name, say her name. What did they mean by that? They wanted me to say Breonna Taylor. The irony that was lost on these hooligans was that I introduced a bill a month before called the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act. It basically has a federal ban of any money to any police force that is still using no-knock raids. And no-knock raids are basically where police come in in the middle of the night, often for drugs, 
and uh, there's not a lot of warning. People inside, um, sometimes understandably, fire back, and then the police fire back, and it's very deadly. It's unsafe for the police, and it's also unsafe for those inside. And I just frankly think for drug possession, it's not worth risking the lives of our policemen or the lives of those inside. So I had introduced a bill a month before to get rid of no-knock raids. I've talked about no-knock raids for probably 10 years now, ever since I ran for office. And it's just something that's a reform that I think we should uh, all embrace. Interestingly, I've talked with four prominent sheriffs yesterday or five prominent sheriffs from more rural counties, not Louisville or Lexington. And they all told me that one of them had been a sheriff for 30 years that he'd never used, couldn't recall ever using a no-knock um, a no knock uh, basic warrant where you go in without announcing yourself in 30 or 40 years of police work. So I don't think it is a must have, and I think it's something we can reform. But what was lost on the people that were threatening us was that I've been active in this. And you know, what do they wanna do? They wanna attack the one Republican. I have two dozen bills with Democrats on criminal justice reform. I've been for expunging records if people behave over a certain period of time. I've been for second chances. I've been for trying to hire people who have criminal records. I've visited restaurants in uh, Lexington and other places who hire people who have a criminal record to give them a second chance. There's nobody, no Republican, I think no Democrat in Congress who's been more for criminal justice reform and second chances than myself. And yet these hooligans threatened to kill me and my wife. How threatening were they? Well, the left, NPR, and even Associated Press said, oh, no evidence of attack, it was no big deal. Well, I defy them. Let them get in the middle of this and see what they feel like. I will also tell you that as we were trying to get to the hotel, one of these marauders forcefully bumped up against the policeman trying to invade the perimeter that they had formed to protect me and virtually just about knocked the policeman over. He's stumbling backwards, and I helped to stabilize him by holding on to his bulletproof vest. And uh, we just found out yesterday that later on, as soon as they had gotten me to my hotel, the same policeman had an altercation with that same protester, ended up getting punched in the face and having stitches. What did the DC government do with this gentleman? What did the court system do? They released him on his own recognizance. This is where the mistake is. We cannot release people immediately back in to go back to rioting. What has to happen is everybody throwing a Molotov cocktail needs to be arrested. Everybody setting a fire needs to be arrested. If you're throwing a Molotov cocktail at a policeman, that is attempted murder and you need serious charges and serious time in jail. If we don't, they will continue. The mayor of Portland has done nothing, and so they have burned the city for 100 days. What does that have to do with Kentucky? Hopefully nothing to do with Paducah or Bowling Green. But unfortunately, we've got something coming up in Louisville where the protesters have now said that they will burn Louisville if they don't like what happens to the police officers involved in this. What I would say is what's more important than really, and, and I'm not gonna comment on the police officers because I don't have all the facts, but what is more important is changing policy to try to prevent any tragedies from happening, either to the police or to people in, inside during these raids. The Louisville Metro Council voted unanimously, including the, the minority of Republicans, all voted to get rid of no-knock raids. There is a reform, the reform has occurred, but we can't let our cities burn, and so, as much as I'm not for the military in our streets and not for the government, uh, federal government being too involved in law enforcement, I think it should be local. I think when the announcement of these raids, come, when the announcement of these, of what happens to these police officers come from our attorney general, I think we're fools if we don't put a thousand or 2000 National Guard in the streets of Louisville, because one, it'll save lives, but two, I think it may save tens of millions of dollars of destruction. You have to see the images, to, and I don't know how anybody can see these images and not be concerned. In Chicago, they're breaking the windows of the, the big famous stores downtown. And as they're doing it, uh, a member of Black Lives Matter, I think it was one of the leaders in Chicago, comes out and says, this is reparations, baby. This is such a terrible message to send to the next generation. What people need to understand is there's actually never ever been a better time to be alive, whether you're white, black, brown, or no matter where you come from, whether you're a minority because you're a homeschooler or you're a minority because of other things, there's never been a better time to be alive. And you say that and people say, oh, you don't understand, you're white, you can't understand racism. I do understand this. If you are a good student and you go to college, 
there is absolutely no bias in college. I don't think you can find a college who is biased against Hispanics or African Americans or anyone for that matter. We've come a long way. We weren't always there, but we have come a long way and we need to appreciate that. And so young men and women of color need to be, be told, you can succeed. Look, look at our law firms, look at our publicly traded companies. There's not a publicly traded company in this country and I say this with, with absolute surety, there's not a publicly traded company that would not love to have an African-American man or woman in their business ranks. I know of no publicly traded company that would not hire you. And in fact, I think there's a, there's a belief, public and private, that they want more diversity in the workplace. All of us seem to be for this, so we shouldn't be telling our young people there's no hope and everybody hates you, so you might as well just break windows and get what you can while you can. That is terrible and a wrong message. We live in a great country. You know, sure, do we have a perfect history? No, and I'm all for people writing books and discussing and revisiting our history. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I've, I've read some of the revisionist history. I've led, read Lerone Bennett, who talks about the Civil War period and says, you know, even the heroes of the Civil War period aren't all, all that they were cracked up to be. They weren't people who believed in true equality. And we should learn about that. But we shouldn't at the same time then say Abraham Lincoln's a terrible person because Abraham Lincoln uh, didn't believe in perfect equality. He didn't. But he frankly was a lot better than a lot of the people in his time. And I think we should be thankful for what he actually did. And we shouldn't tear down statues to Grant, who actually tried to eradicate the KKK and went into the South when the governments were not obeying and actually tried to fix some of the violence. So I think we have to, we have to reassess things as a country. There's so much anger out there. On the internet, if you look on Twitter at the responses to things I post, half of them wish me more violence. Look, I had six of my ribs broken. I was sick for two years coughing up blood. I had part of my lung removed, all from somebody who hated my politics, all from somebody who hated President Trump. You know, when did it become so hateful? When President Obama was in office, I went to the White House multiple times. I tried to work with President Obama and did on criminal justice reform. But as much as people seem to hate President Trump, President Obama didn't get criminal justice reform done. President Trump did and signed the bill into the law. It isn't perfect, but it's a big step forward. And we got it done. Look in Kentucky, expunging people's records after a certain period of time for a lot of different crimes, a few crimes were excluded, was done under Governor Bevin and a Republican legislature with the help of Democrats. But this isn't a one-way street. There's actually a lot of bipartisan support. But when people are being attacked and threatened and they say their goal is to terrorize us, we're not going to move forward. So the big part of the message I have this morning for everyone is that there's got to be a better way. And we can oppose each other politically, but surrounding and terrorizing our public officials isn't the answer. I'd like to briefly talk a little bit about COVID. Um, I think it's, you know, you, you watch things on the news and sometimes it's hard to find any good news. I will tell you that there is a great deal of good news out there coming. One, the treatment's gotten a lot better. The vast majority of patients who require oxygen are now getting remdesivir, which is an antiviral. It is uh, helping with outcomes. Not perfect, but it's helping a significant amount. They're also getting steroids. Almost everybody is getting dexamethasone, and this is helping to prevent the crisis. If you get treated after the crisis, it's very hard to treat this. You've got to treat this before your lungs start leaking fluid. Once your lungs are full of fluid, they can't have enough pressure to push air into your lungs and no uh, transfer of oxygen can occur. But these two things, remdesivir and also oxygen, and you wouldn't know this by watching the media, but people still are using hydroxychloroquine. And there's an article in a peer-reviewed journal coming out this week that actually says that hydroxychloroquine is a benefit. So there are some good things with treatment. The other good thing about COVID is if you look at the curves, and this is probably the most remarkable thing, and people still haven't acknowledged this enough. In New York, they had a terrible surge. They had the highest death rate of anywhere in the world. So they didn't get everything right. They actually had the worst record of anywhere in the world. But the good news is now they suffered so much that they're not getting it again. And some have said, oh, we'll have wave after wave of this. So far, the proof is that your community can develop herd immunity, not with 60%, but maybe with much less. About a third of New York got COVID and has antibodies. But there is a theory out now, and I subscribe to this, that about a third of the public has some immunity already. 
These are the people like myself who got it, but had very mild symptoms. And the reason we had very mild symptoms, I think, is because I've probably been infected previously with coronavirus colds. About 20% of the common cold is coronavirus. It's not the same as COVID, but it's in the same family. And there may be enough overlap of the proteins on the outside of the, the uh, wall of the virus. There may be some cross reactivity that means when I get it, my body sees that I've had something like this before and responds to this. So well over 90% are getting mild or asymptomatic. That doesn't take away the tragedy of the deaths, but uh, most people are getting through this and we're going to. The question is, will it disappear like other viruses? The president said he thinks it'll disappear and he's lampooned endlessly by the liberal media. Most viruses do disappear over time. SARS, uh, which came about about 15 years ago, was a deadly coronavirus. It did disappear after a year or two and hadn't come back. MERS is another coronavirus, same thing. Uh, Spanish flu, the worst virus that, that we have ever recorded, did go away and didn't come back really ever again. Its, it's cousins have come back but after long periods of time. So I think that the communities are developing immunity. Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California developed the same type of surge that New York had, but much less, uh, they did a much better job controlling it. Only about a third of the people di uh, uh, died in Florida, Texas, California, and Arizona has died in New York. I think that their surge, which is now declining, actually means that they may have enough immunity that it's gonna stop the spread. What we don't know is about rural states like ours. We've had a slight and steady uptick in disease in Kentucky, but we haven't had a major killing surge like they had in either Florida or, or New York or any of these states. We're lucky, and that's the question, whether or not we're, we'll have a sort of a flat curve and not ever get a surge and whether or not that'll prevent us from keep getting it or whether we get it at a slow trickle for a longer period of time. But I think there is good news. I think there'll be a vaccine in the fall. Um, I think millions of people will line up to do it. I think it should be voluntary. And I think that uh, most people at risk will take it immediately and they should be first in line. Those in their 80s, those in nursing homes uh, should be first in line and let people make that choice. But I think there is good news on that front. On what do we do about our economy? You know, we got 700,000 people out of work in, Florida, in, in Kentucky. You know, it's all caused because the government has shut the economy down. I think it was a mistake to shut things down so much and we need to open as quickly as possible. If you look at Sweden, they didn't close any businesses. They told people to work on quarantine, contact tracing, and to try not to be going out, but they didn't enforce closure of business. They're gonna end up with about the same death rate as the US. Right now, the death rate in Sweden, everybody complained about in the beginning was about 570 per million. Right now, US is about 540 per million. They're, U.S. is eventually going to get to Sweden or exceed Sweden, but Sweden's like New York now. They're not getting any more infections or deaths. So uh, there are some arguments, and, and we should look at this because we can't do this every year or two, every time a new virus comes out. We, we can't shut the economy down, and it's a misery right now what's happening, and we can't just print money up and give it to you either. We've done that for the last several months, and it has lessened the blow of this, but we have... We were borrowing a trillion dollars before the COVID bailouts. We added three trillion to that. So this year, the deficit's gonna be over four trillion. I suspect when I go back next week, there's an end of the year spending bill, which is usually enormous and shows no budgetary reform. That will pass as it always does with increased spending. Republicans will get more for the military. Democrats will get more for welfare programs and it will pass, but they'll probably add another trillion dollars is my guess to the, to the COVID bailouts. So what's gonna happen is we're probably gonna end up with a five trillion or more deficit for this year. To put that in perspective, George W. Bush had a $5 trillion debt over eight years, and I complained as a Republican that that was wrong, that was too much debt. President Obama had uh, $10 trillion over eight years, and I complained about that as well. But now we're doing $5 trillion in about five or six months. The danger is you destroy the value of your currency, and you may get a check, and somebody may send you a check, but the danger is that it may take twice as much money to buy what you used to buy for the same amount of price. In other words, inflation. We haven't seen inflation in a long time, but we've never printed up and handed out this much money in such a short space of time. People say, well, the US currency can't be rocked. It's so strong, it's the strongest in the world. That's been true for a long time, but other people describe it as the US dollar is the, uh, a, a dirty shirt uh, or the cleanest shirt in a, in a closet full of dirty shirts. All the currencies are weak, but we just happen to be stronger than other weak currencies. 
but it is not unheard of for a currency to be destroyed and a country's economy to be destroyed. So I'm very fearful of what comes next. If the economy is still closed after the election, if people take over our government who want further and more extreme lockdown, then I think we're going, uh, we're headed for a major stock market correction, particularly if the election comes about and people say, I'm going to shut down the economy and I can do better with the virus and we're going to do, we're going to do more of a lockdown. I fear a huge correction in the stock market, but also the economy would just be destroyed. We already have massive unemployment created by the government shutdown. It'll get worse if we continue this. So the bottom line is we have to work together, Republicans and Democrats, to open the economy. If we don't, uh, there's going to be a significant amount of pain in our country. We started out very rich as a country and with lowest unemployment in 50 years as a country, but we're headed towards a real bad place. I hope we can work together. I hope that Republicans and Democrats can decide that the Black Lives Matter that is, that is uh, you know, advocating this violence in our streets that they will disavow them. I've asked Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to disavow the Black Lives Matter and those who are attacking us in DC haven't heard a word, but I hope they will. And instead of just pointing fingers, we need to say that it is inexcusable and that these people need to be arrested. Those throwing Molotov cocktails, those assaulting policemen, those assaulting politicians, those assaulting anybody need to be arrested. But uh, I have hope for our country. Uh, we have a great history and I think a great future but we got to get beyond some of these divisions. We got to get beyond the virus. And then we all just have to get back to work. I appreciate the invitation. I look forward to coming and visiting you sometime in the near future. Thank you, Senator Paul. We appreciate you joining us today. As I mentioned earlier, we had scheduled this program with him in January of this year. No one could have ever imagined what would happen between then and now. But meanwhile, back in Paducah, I can assure you that the Paducah Chamber is doing everything that we can to rebuild our economy and to help all of our small businesses. As I mentioned about our small business celebration, don't forget that we have our seminars coming up every Wednesday at 8 a.m. And also we have our October 1st uh, Power and Partnership Breakfast, with, um, which will be our forum for the candidates for mayor and the State House Representative District 3. So I, we appreciate the sponsorship of Whitlow Roberts, Houston and Straub. As I've said, our sponsors have been staying with us through this virtual, this pivot that we had to do to virtual programs, and we appreciate them very much. And if Chris if, uh, Hudson, if you would come up, we're gonna draw for some door prizes from you guys. And I'm gonna stick that way out there. <laughs> And let me just say, please stay with us after the drawings for the door prizes because we do have those three videos that we're gonna show uh, of those small businesses that were drawn in the last breakfast to feature today. And then they'll be shown uh, on our Facebook page and social media throughout the next month. Okay, thank you. So today's winners are Megan Kosowski with Northwestern Mutual, Sheila Barger with Marquette, and Shannon Tudor with Beacon Property. So those were rep, uh, registered on Zoom. You have to be registered on our Zoom call to be eligible for door prizes. Again, thank you to Whitlow Roberts, Houston, and Straub. We'll see you at some event coming up in September and again on October 1st at our Power and Partnership Breakfast. That one is sponsored by Paducah Bank and those are the candidates for uh, mayor and for state house uh, repre of representatives. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now stay tuned for these three videos about three very important uh, small businesses to our community. We'll see you soon. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Woods. I'm the owner of Bluegrass Orthodontics. Some of the things that we offer are very unique to our practice. I personally see every single patient every time they come in. We work with our families hand in hand to develop a treatment plan that works for them and us. We always want to be as flexible as possible so that we can work together. We never want to put somebody in a situation that they're uncomfortable being in. So I try and explain absolutely everything to them so you know what the plan is, where we're going, and if you have any questions whatsoever, we are always there to answer them. We also really try and work with our schedules. We try and be as flexible as possible we always want to make sure that everybody can get in in an appropriate time. We never want you waiting in our waiting room for any excess amount of time. We like to get you in, say hello with a friendly face at our front desk, get you seated, 
have our work done, and then be on your way to your busy life. At Bluegrass Orthodontics, our patients are our first priority. We're here to see you smile. If you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to call us, check us out on Facebook, or visit our website at bluegrassorthodontics.com. We're located right in the center of downtown Paducah at 2307 Kentucky Avenue and have been for the last 37 years, so we're not going anywhere. Hi, I'm Deanna Basil from Fern Lake Campground in Paducah, Kentucky. And we have been serving visitors to Paducah for 43 years. We have 60 sites and half of those have a full hookup, electric water and sewer. It's just a good location because it feels like we're out in the country, but we're just a mile from the mall and a lot of restaurants. It's a great location. Uh, it's quiet, it's clean, it's our home. Fern Lake is also a Good Sam Park. Good Sam is a camping club with over 2 million members and campgrounds all over the country. I feel like we're a great ambassador for the city of Paducah. Sometimes people will come in to stay for one night and they'll end up staying two or three because Paducah has so much to offer. You can find us at fernlakecampground.net and we're also on Facebook. So give us a call and we'd love to see you and tell you a little bit about our town. Getting a massage at Jenny's Reflexology and Massage is like going on vacation without ever leaving Paducah. Jenny's Reflexology and Massage is at 4965 Village Square Drive, Suite E, across from Gaither Suites. Jenny's offers a variety of massages, such as Swedish, Medium Deep, Deep Tissue, Stone Massage, and more. Jenny's also offers Cold Stone Therapy for migraines. Take advantage of this special, a two-hour spa combo, which includes a hot stone massage, scalp massage, YL oils, heat packs, ion detoxification with reflex and more, all for only $109. Make your appointment today at Jenny's Reflexology and Massage. Call 270-994-0742 and feel better soon.